or this one. Okay, so here's our overview of the slides that have been given there. I'll put the slides in. Um, so here's our pests. We'll go through pest control measures. So I'll just review all this and the causes of plant problems and then go through some. I thought we went through this. You don't remember this at all? Okay, well, here we go. We see we forgot one here. Got insects for the six classifications of pests. We've got insects, diseases, rodents, birds, weeds, weather. And I would accept people too. Okay, and other animals. So anything that could cause problems that's going to wreck your crop, you know, whether it's grass or whatever. Okay, all those can, can do that. And basically, the plants uh, basically have uh, evolved really quickly to keep up with what we need. And that rapid, rapid evolution is what makes us have so many plant problems. Okay, because over time, it takes a while. You get natural predators in. And when we change things, we squish our crops together. When we put a really dense turf in and don't uh, think about what's going to happen, then we can keep moisture in there. Insects can come in and all that. And we might not have the natural predators that would take that thing out. So that we actually have caused a lot of our own problems by uh, having to, to uh, make more food, you know, have denser grass for what we can work with. And just for when we rip something up, we got to have something to put back down. And we might bring in plants we think will be adapted, and they're not. OK? I apologize if, you, if I didn't do this before. OK, so what would happen if we stopped using pesticides today? What do you think would happen? A lot of weeds, could have a lot of weeds, have a lot of diseases, a lot of insects. Probably lose a lot of crops, wouldn't we? If we stopped using pesticides, there'd be rodents in a lot of places. There'd be some things that would, you know, balance out because you'd have natural predators there too. But the things that we change, you might get something way out of balance and we'd really be in a world of hurt if we had nothing. We wouldn't have enough food to feed people. That's why we developed a lot of the pesticides was just because we couldn't do it with the natural product that we had. So it's nice to want to go all organic, and I would say that that's a, a, an admirable goal, but you're never going to feed all the people in the world that way. Um, and that's probably the main reason that they went with the, with the production of synthetics. Okay, so if we look at, and I'm just looking at all the crops, all the insects and diseases. Okay, we have over 80,000 species in the United States, but only about 10% are a detriment to agriculture, or that's 10%. 10,000, so an eighth of them, are a detriment to all of agriculture. We have about just 60 of all these 80,000 that produce crop yield. Okay, that includes turf. And look how much money we spend to control. 10 billion plus. Okay, and if we look at diseases, we have a lot less diseases, eight times less, only 10,000 diseases, only 10,000 in North America. About 500 will cause 10 to 12 percent loss in yield, and we're going to spend over eight billion dollars to control those diseases. Okay, so that's a, just a general. I don't have any. We we did we did turf things, and I'm just going to keep it general for us for right now. We just look at some of the agricultural things by the numbers. Post harvest is what's post harvest mean? After I've, after I've picked the crop post-harvest, so that could be storage, other things. You can get 9% while you're stored. If we look at the, so we get an overall picture of the main crops. Notice turf isn't even in the list here, you know, of all the big, the big numbers. Because these are the, these are the guys, the, the movers and shakers of the world, okay, or the agricultural. When we get our, all of our pesticides, whether it's a, a weed control, an insect, or a disease, all of them come out of agriculture. And since we're working with grasses, a lot of them come out of rice. Okay, if they see something, so rice is going to push the production of this herbicide way before turf will. Okay, so that's, that's the, the thing. And they spend lots of money. But you see, and again, my research data is over 10 years old. I need to get in there and, and uh, look at that. But I just wanted you to get an idea that, you know, we're not the only ones that use pesticides. Okay, we're a very small percentage. Okay, and if we look at how we use them by state, okay, 
Washington's in there. Okay, can you think of why they might be in there? Well, we only produce, what, 99 different crops in the state of Washington? Okay, it's not because of the turf that we're in the high in the list. We've got what? Apples, cherries, wheat, barley, lentils. We produce 90% of the lentils in the U.S. I mean, if you look at that, we're just a small portion. We don't make the list, but but that's that's what we we look at here. And you got a lot of crops, you know, cranberries. And if you think of all the different crops and what it takes, and again, this is fungicide use. If you look at the the lower amounts are in the um, blue states, and the higher amounts are in the orange. And let's just not even look at the numbers, but look at where my where's my orange? It's on the coasts, isn't it? Okay, and I got higher humidity along the coast, anywhere there's water. Okay, I don't know what's going on here up in North Dakota, but anyway. So you see we've got probably a lot of wheat and other crops, and it's a short season. If you look about where they're, where they're located, and, you know, here, there's going to be a, a delineation here. It depends on what you're growing. These are agricultural crops. You know, when we get up into the eastern side, when it gets less moist, we're going to have less diseases. Okay. But you look at the top users of insecticides, and again, we're looking at crop situations. Um, citrus, cotton, apples, that would be why Washington's so high on the list corn for the Midwest, almonds. Your nut crops are very high uh, as far as value, so they're going to protect them. So almonds, walnuts, uh, hazelnuts, and then we've got all our, our fruit and potatoes is a huge crop. And again, if you see where we're most of the insecticide use, okay, except for Washington and Oregon, well, see, we're, we're still considered part of the, the coast here. If we look at it, it's all in the southeast. So again, the high numbers are where our major production can go on most of the year in some of these areas, right? On the coastal areas. Okay, so that's just a... And here's the Irish, Irish potato famine. Okay, basically, it was an old variety that they used, and that's all they ate in... Ireland. If we hadn't had the Irish potato famine, a lot of our families never would have come to the United States. Okay, and you see that basically they ate 7 million tons of potato annually. It's a lot of taters, right? We still eat a lot. But notice that, that what happened was the, the varieties matured and then after they, they got into, um, they matured in September and October, so they used a lot of storage stuff. So in July and August, they didn't have anything until they got their new crop. So what happened was is that the uh, potato famine uh, basically the disease made it so that all of the potatoes would uh, for them to eat. And if you look at the, um, and basically it's called late blight potatoes, and they found out later on it was Phytophthora and Festans, and that goes in a lot of other, other crops. I mean, a lot of other, we can get ornamental plants. It's a uh, disease that can be moved in the soil. Um, and basically, notice this is back in 1845, and they didn't know what was going on, but the leaves started turning black and curling, and then the potatoes rotted. And this happened. This late blight went on for three of the next four years, which is why, you know, the, the population left. And they didn't know what it was. They thought it was people were sinning, you know, judgment from their abusive landlords, okay, static electricity from trains. I like this, mortiferous, so deathly vapors from volcanoes. Okay, but we had a million that were killed and a million fled the country, so you had a quarter of your population leaving Ireland within a couple of years. Okay, that's that's a lot leaving leaving either via their own means or they had to they were no longer in existence how about that and that's what it looked like you don't really want to eat mushy potatoes do you I mean you might want mashed potatoes but not the mushy ones and I'm not going to expect you to know all this but this kind of gives you the history of the plant protection problems outside of turf that we went through and the Bordeaux mixture this is what I thought was the very first fungicide 
um, and it was kind of discovered uh, by accident. And basically in one of the, the Modoc region in, in France, they, they were trying to keep the kids from eating the grapes when they went home from school. So they just sprayed a poisonous looking mixture that had sulfur and, uh, do I have the mix there? Yeah, copper sulfate, which is the sulfur, lime, and water. Okay, so that, so you had 10, 10, and 100 as far as copper sulfate, lime, and water. And basically they just put it on there so it looked terrible, so they wouldn't eat it. They didn't know it did anything. And then they noticed at, when they sprayed it that the grapes looked a lot better. They didn't get all kinds of diseases. And notice, they, so they accidentally found out it was a fungicide and a bactericide. So it keeps fire blight off of the pears, apples, and grapes, leaf curl, downy and powdery mildew. It's still used a lot in uh, fruit production. Walnut blight on walnut, black spot on roses. Okay, so that was, that was the um, first identified fungicide. Okay, and so that, it was quite by accident. Okay, so why do we get problems? Because we very intensively work with crops. So what happens with turf? Where do we get the most problems on turf? Probably in our highest use areas, right? Where we, where we mow them close, where we're putting more water, fertilizer, everything on it. So the more intensively we manage it, the more pests we can have. Okay, and, and basically we might actually bring in some species that would upset the checks and balances too because of what we're doing. If we're mowing it down to a tenth of an inch on one, in one area, I would probably be more likely to have a problem with a pest on that area because it's stressed than out in the rough or someplace else where it's got more leaf tissue and it can photosynthesize and pair itself. And that's also the place where we get the most money from our players, too, right? If we're working with golf courses or on a sports field. You know, if I don't have grass on, a, on an athletic field at this time of year when I'm going to the Super Bowl, I'm screwed, aren't I? Okay? And you know, you, everybody's there. You watch on TV, and that's, that's a, a major thing. And I've got some interesting data, not to get off the subject, but we did a lot with sports turf damage. And we had a lot of uh, presentations about concussions, and I had to watch one. I didn't have to, but I sat there and watched one on turf toe, and they take cadavers and actually put them in the machine. You know, they cut off the leg and bend it all around, and we were watching pictures of how long it took to snap the bones and everything on that. And so they're, they were looking at that. And they, they have, this is the first year you'll see in the locker rooms of the NFL, they'll actually have different types of shoes that you should not wear on artificial surfaces okay, because the cleats stick too much, and that's why they're getting all the injuries. So there is a difference between natural and, and uh, yep. In the middle, it all depends on which field you're at. But if you can actually see a difference, they probably resodded the whole middle of the field. They probably brought in four, the, the four-inch depth of sand, and and it's a Bermuda grass overseeded with a rye or a, a, a Kentucky bluegrass rye blend, and they bring it in. You know, a week in advance. So it doesn't, it, and that stuff is so heavy. They lay it out in these big rolls, and it is so heavy, it does not move. So if it looked different, they probably resodded it, or they could have overseeded this center again. Depends on where the location is. In Green Bay, it would have been side. Okay, in other places, we could, they could have reseeded it. Okay, but the main thing is, is when we do any of these special things with crops or with this, nature alone can't sustain that area, whether it's food for the population or what we're doing, you're going to have to put in some extra inputs, okay? And when, ta when we're talking about food for the entire population, that's a real problem, okay? We, we have got to be able to feed the people. And that's actually one of the reasons not to get off of the subject, but that's why GMOs were brought on, was so that you could insert a gene so that we could prevent a disease or, you know, a particular disease from affecting a crop and then I wouldn't have to spray a fungicide or I could get more uh, production out of it by doing it. So it was brought in for the good of trying to feed the population. It wasn't meant to, you know, mess with us. But, you know, where you got a lot of food, you don't have to make a lot of these changes. But where you don't have food and you need to produce as much as you can to feed the world, you, you have to see what can you change to make it better. And that would be one of the things.
So one of the main reasons, and again, this is with turf as well, if we've got a monoculture, why do you think we put two or three different types of grass in a mixture? Okay, if I have it all the same, if one has more of a susceptibility to a disease than, a, than another, it's all going to go out and I've at least got something else left. Okay, so that's why we usually put a, a couple different types and, and, and make sure that they mix together. Okay, one of the reasons that we have more problems is because we're all traveling everywhere. Where are you going, Arizona? Okay, he, hopefully he didn't bring anything back with him, you know, as far as plant, plant diseases or anything like that. But that's, basically that's why we develop quarantine. But, you know, if you drive into a state, you know, you can get stuff in your bumper and come back and stuff. So weeds go that way. They come with birds and animals and stuff. So the fact, that's why if you go to a foreign country and you're going someplace, the first thing they're going to ask you, if it's an island country, is if you've been to a farm and they're going to check your boots. And if you've got any fertilizer or anything on them, you know, or any dirt, they got to be quarantined. So if you're going somewhere, you make sure you wash your boots with bleach water and everything. And, and uh, I usually don't tell them I've been on a farm. You know, because even my research farm, because they would just, they're afraid you're going to bring in something. So you just need to make sure. And they have dogs that check everything. No fruit. And they can smell. If you had an apple in your pack the day before, they will, that dog will sit down right next to you. Even if you have nothing in there then. It happened to one of my friends when we traveled in New Zealand. The little, little beagle came over and sat down right next to him and said, Sir, do you have, you know, fruit or something in your pack? He said, no, but I had an apple yesterday for lunch, and that's what it was. He could, the beagle could still smell the apple from the day before. So, but that's what we've had to go to to try to prevent some of this stuff. And, you, and anybody going into California or even around here, apple maggot signs, you know, you can't carry fruit into the state because you aren't supposed to be taking. Absolutely. So you can't bring stuff in. If you've got fruit, it gets dumped out so you don't haul stuff in. So that's, those are the other things that we've done to protect items as well. And shipping things, any, any of our ports is, is usually where all of our big disease things come from too. If people pass, uh, there's an organization called APHIS, which is the Agricultural Experimental Plant Health Inspection Stations. And if you're bringing any plant material, it's got to go through APHIS. No soils allowed, everything's got to be washed off, you know, so that's the reason that it's there, so that we don't get these problems. And we still get problems. You know, I've been to the south and seen the kudzu they brought in. You know, just just like our uh, Himalayan blackberries. Okay, they brought it in to to control or to put on the roadsides. You know, what happened? It all escaped. It was too well adapted. We don't have any natural. They're look, working on natural controls, but we don't. So we have to use a, a pesticide. And I'll just I'm just looking at. You can see how things have traveled here. Corn borer came in a shipment of corn from Europe. Chestnut blight came from China. Okay, and we've shared back actually that potato potato blight we shared with we shared the phytophthora with Ireland. So so we want it, it goes back and forth. Okay, notice beetles and soil around roots of ornamentals. And then if we keep using pesticide, DDT is just a bad example of a pesticide. We thought it was, you know, the answer to everything because it took things out, but flies because they have such a fast regenerative cycle, okay, they became resistant very quickly. Okay, because didn't we talk about in uh, our uh, life cycles, you know, if we if we didn't interrupt with flies, we, you know, they kept going with 10 generations for 10 cycles per year, we'd have flies 47 feet deep. That's just a lovely thought, isn't it? Okay, because, it, and that resistance carries through all those populations because it goes so fast. And then you can find that new a race is a new uh, disease strain, and so you can breed resistance into one, and then, in ten years later, it's 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 already changed how it's it's resistant to that particular product or that that uh, fungicide, and so then they've got a, a different disease that comes in and takes it out. Okay, so there's there's we have to think a lot about if we're going to use a fungicide or, you know, we're pretty much on insecticides yet. If we're going to use something, we need to rotate it so that we don't end up having to making our problem worse. We could take one thing out and something else will come in that's worse. Okay, so it's a big puzzle pick. Or it's a big it's a big puzzle and we're trying to figure out what piece do we change to make it better but not worse. Okay, because one piece can change the whole picture, can't it? And that's why and on your job, you've got a lot of different things you're balancing out there. 
you know, let alone the people. You've got all the grasses to work with too, but you've got to work with the people because the, if the people part doesn't work, we don't have a job anymore, right? That's that's a problem. People are our biggest pest, okay? Anyway, so notice here the solution to one problem can create others. And just in here we had blue stem wheat resistance to scab and some of these diseases, and then it was susceptible to stem rust. Okay, so that's just what I was talking about, is if you can look and see, uh, grow a plant that's resistant to what could be your worst problem in your area, and then you might have to spray it for something else. Okay, so we just have to keep working with it as we go. Okay, and we can have some other different types of, of pest problems. You could actually have not enough nutrition, so you can get a, nu a nutritional disorder could cause a pest problem. Um, if I don't have uh, natural predators to reduce it, because the beneficials out in the world will reduce some of my pest populations, so if they go away, I could get more um, insects or pests. And here's the other thing is, as we go organic, um, you're going to see that they're going to allow some other spots and things to develop because they aren't going to spray them. Okay, but we know that consumers, just like on a golf course, how many spots could you have on a green or on a football field? How many spots could you have out there before somebody's going to get upset? Just about 10% is a lot. You know, so they're, they're probably going to want 1% to 2%. Is, it probably would still, but they want it perfect. You know, they don't want to see it. So when we get into eating, you know, they grade the fruit, and only the best grades get good prices. So the coals and the discarded ones are at a very low price, but we could still feed a lot of people on that. You know, the same thing with turf. We, we've, got, we've got to train them that, you know, we, we're going to have to have some level of imperfection. Okay, it can't always be perfect, but that's not what they want. So these are just some cold. Those apples look okay to me. I could eat those with a few bruises and stuff. But those are the ones that are going to be sold for juice, okay, because they've got minor imperfections in them. Okay, so just cultural practices to produce a healthy crop. Know what pests to expect as we go through. What's your pest life cycle, which is what we were learning, right? And materials and methods for combat. we still got to get to that. Okay, and what, what, let's see, what should we look at here? We know agriculture isn't natural because we put it in a field and, you know, box it in, right? Um, we've changed natural evolution by uh, growing crops in a more intense and increased production area. Why might we get more bugs and blights? Maybe because of this up here, same thing. And because people are traveling around the world. Um, can you think of a situation where it may not be worthwhile to control that pest? Where might it, can you think of one where you might not want to control it? It doesn't have to be turf, you could think of another. What if I'm about ready to harvest my carrots or something, you know, and I've got a like a 24 hour wait period before you can get in the field or you know, a lot of the food stuff, you have to spray it at least a week before you harvest it. What, what, if, um, what if the only product I had for a disease on turf that I, that I knew of, or an insect on turf, and it was causing minor damage, had a 24-hour a stay out of the area or 48-hour reentry period? Would you use that product? A 48-hour reentry period, and, and, you're, on a, and, and you're, you're coming up on a big event. No. So that's where you have to read the product labels real closely, right? You would choose something that if, if it's not that much damage, you wait until after the event and then use it and then come in to see how you could do it. And this, again, if I'm, if I'm getting ready to harvest it the next day, you know, the damage is already done. Why would I control it then? Okay. So, and what if, what if the, the insect was already gone? I caught it after the, after the insect had already pupated or was in pupa, in, you know, it's already in the soil. I wouldn't waste my money, would I? So what stage of life cycle? That's going to make a big difference as to whether I put out something. And we already talked about this. It wouldn't be much of a benefit to us to destroy everything in the world, would it? Okay, I'm not going to, we're not going to worry about that. So we're going to finish that talk right there. Let's see, I hope this doesn't close everything, but it probably will.
I was trying to see what, if that's the right arrow. Okay, good. Okay, we'll go back to... So that, that kind of answered our questions that I couldn't figure out why you didn't know that stuff, since I didn't look through that. What about if we look at the structure? Let's just go through that real quickly. Because that's where we started to see if it'll let me do this one this time. You know what the problem is? I think everything's all in the same. I thought I downloaded it. There it is. Okay, it just didn't. Okay, so one of the questions that you had is right here. It's about the fourth slide in, which is diagram an insect cuticle. Okay, so those are the, the major portions of it, and those are already in the slides for you. So what can you think of just looking at this? What parts of this, what, what might be three functions of the cuticle? Can you think of when we talked about external structures? What does, what does the cuticle do for the insect? Okay, internal organs. What else could it lose if it didn't have? Here I am. So it protects it and also as a structure actually holds it together too. Do you remember how they got their colors? Can, the, can this chitin that's on the outside surface of this, you remember that... Uh, it can have hairs, protuberances. So basically that, that outside shell can be its, its uh, protection too. Not just, not just for, um, but to, so it can camouflage. That's another reason. Okay, because the chitin could actually have coloration in it or that might be the color of the insect blood. It might be a clear coat and, you know, like, cause you see that green splash on your screen. That's usually their blood is whatever color they, what they've been eating lately. Okay. Uh, let's go on to the. So we got moths, we got colored hairs and scales, we can have pigments. Okay. We already looked at that. Doot, 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 doot. Pretty, pretty insects. Okay. You need to know the three major structures head, thorax, abdomen. Because all our insects are going to be that. No matter, you know, if it's an insect, that's what they're going to have. Okay, they're going to develop into that. And what's the main thing that uh, the question on the back side is, what's, what's always attached to the thorax? It's right there, isn't it? Legs and wings. So if you use this handout and go through the notes, you'll be in good shape. Okay, because I tried to, I tried to do that. Pick out the questions. Okay. And We'll just go through that. This would be, I'll pull this down a little bit. Basically, this is a, a good figure of the grasshopper. Okay, remember we talked about the spiracles being the breathing holes. These two little things here, that's an ovipositor on a female. You've got the, the leg structures. You've got a femur and a tibia just like we do. This is a really tough one, the wings, huh? on that one. I don't care about this as much down here, just so you know that's the thorax. And the, the little hooks, the tarsus, are kind of important because that's what helps them crawl up most of the insects. So if we looked at, at uh, let me go back one though, because it says where's the, does it have the, oh that was on the antenna so I'm not there yet. The scape, the pedicel, and the, and the flagellum. The flagellum's the end of the, let's go to the, it's off, off the next slide. You should be able to label these. This will be. Okay. Basically, you're going to need to know the major parts. 
that are labeled here. Like I said, I don't care about, you, know, you need to know the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Know what spiracles are, that that's an ovipositor. Okay, the, the, you can, you know wings. So the femur, the tibia, tarsus. Okay, when we get down to the, I'm trying to breeze through this, when we get down to the antenna, notice they can be used for feeling, smelling, hearing. Okay, because I asked you to say what are three possible functions of antenna. You can find food, find mates, communicate. And there's your major parts. If you look at that, you've got the scape is what connects to the head, the pedicels, the base, and flagellum is what's so different on each one of them. Okay, and make sure when you come to the test to bring that paper I gave you. Remember we went through and we identified different types of antenna in class? So I'll have some pictures to show you. Probably look a lot like what we saw in class, and you just need to be, you'll have that with you, and we'll just look at it. Okay? We'll probably start the test that way, and then I'll have them printed out, and you can look at them more later, you know, so we'll go through. Absolutely. You are not required to memorize that. Yeah. So have your, have your, uh, picture with you. And let's see. Those are all the different types already. We've already looked at those. We've got them in the lecture, so I don't need to... I'm trying to make sure we get through these. Okay. You should know what a compound dye is. That's it. What are all these little things called? Facets. Okay, so those are on, that's on mature insects. Okay, the little little baby ones don't have, they get the compound eyes as they go through. So up until that point, they have those, we went through that head diagram pretty quickly, but the other thing they have are just the things that, that sense light. They got three little dots up here, and those are called ocelli. So that's something you're going to have to more than likely label on a picture. Okay. So it says, what are ocelli? How many, how many do adult insects typically have? Yeah. When they're, when they're in their in, infant stages, I call them, when they're earlier instars, they have more, and they lose them because their compound eyes develop them. So basically, they're just trying to keep going. Um, let's go to mouth parts. I'm trying to go through this. I wonder if that's in there. Okay, so we have four main mouth parts. So we got the upper lip, their mandibles, the maxillae. Those are the things that go like this, too, to help put things in their mouth, and then their lower lip. So you can do upper lip, lower lip, mandibles for biting and chewing, and the maxillae, which help put things in the mouth. Okay, and then the last thing, and the main reason I'm going through this is so that you know what the, the possible types of damage we could get. And then here are your different, six different types of insect mouth parts. You've got the mandibles for chewing, and then the other five that are listed under the hostellate or the other types are piercing, sucking, rasping, sucking, sponging, siphoning, chewing, lapping. Okay, and there are examples of each one of those on the other slides that we have in here. It's already 12.15. So, okay, so that went through this whole sheet. The other thing that I haven't gone through for your, and this just shows you all the different mouth parts. There's a lot of material on this test. Okay, and then the other, the other, oh, I did it, didn't I? Okay, let me close that. The last, um, your internal structures, which you did your, your diagrams on, you've got a review sheet for that, for your internal organs. And I guess this is where, if you had some questions on this, so we can go over pretty quickly. Um, I think the main thing um, in looking at that is, let me get this on here. I'll go through this real quick. 
you've got your main systems, circulatory, nervous, respiratory, reproductive, and the secretion systems. Um, you should know how those work, what they look like. What did you find out when you're working with your intestinal tract? Just goes down the middle, out the back of the insect, right? Basically, it attaches to the mouth, and then it goes through. You can see it right here, right? It goes through here. you got your salivary glands, goes in the mouth, crop, gizzard, and then it goes into your large intestine, small intestine, anus, out the back. Okay, so it's got to, it's got to go through the body. My heart, or what, what is my, what is my, uh, circulatory system look like? It's just this up here, isn't it? Right? Here's my heart, my pumping. It pumps it up to here, and then it just, this is all my blood in here, isn't it? All through here. That's all blood. Okay, there aren't any arteries or veins. Right. On the top. Okay, they're on the top side of the insect, so it, the the blood, it this is yeah the blood this is all blood through here, yeah, so basically it it looks like a diluted blood, okay so they don't have veins so basically all you have to do is kind of shade that because I think I asked you to shade it because basically it's got to go through the whole body doesn't it to give it food, okay if we look at some of the others that's the main difference the the blood just goes throughout the whole body if we go on through there's the digestive tract um, circulatory system. Remember, insects don't have veins or arteries. It goes from high pressure to low. Nervous system. The main thing is, if you look at this, what does this look like? Here's my, here's my nerves. I got all these ganglia. One is a ganglion, so all the ganglia come together. For the, I've got two things that go around here and connect with the ones from the brain. So there's three that, that actually run from the brain. And notice I have little ones that go out to the antennae. And, well, you don't have the legs on here, but there are ones that go to the legs as well. Okay, but it kind of looks like a... If I had to describe that, it almost looks like a bunch of tree branches going all over the place, right? It's all connected together. Okay, if I don't have nerves, there has to be nerves everywhere. And, and if you look at this, isn't it pretty similar to what the respiratory system looks like, too? If we... I, I'm trying to think if I've got one. Yeah, respiratory system. So with the respiratory system, same thing. I've got branches going everywhere, okay, because I've got all those spiracles, right, that go along the bottom. And when it says here it's got inspiration, so usually they'll come in the front here through these spiracles, and they exit through the back. Okay, and I can block all of them but one, and the insect can still breathe. All right, but it doesn't have any lungs. It just goes through all those little branches. So the blood doesn't carry the oxygen. These do. I'm just trying, I'm going pretty fast here, I'm trying to, oh, their reproductive organs are very similar to ours, okay? And if you're trying to put both the male or female, just make sure you label which one you put in because most of them aren't going to have the same parts, right, and the same thing. And notice our secretory organs, salivary glands, scent glands, glands that produce waxy substances. Defense glands, these are all modified organs, okay? Modified glands are stingers. Well, the salivary gland was in that picture that was just there. It comes up to the mouth. Did you see? If you look on those slides, there's a picture where the salivary gland is in there, okay? That would be a stinger, so it's going to be on its rear end. Yeah, on the, on the end. And you could, if you were going to have a bee, you could have their, it could produce wax. It's kind of hard. Just know what, that they're modified glands. Okay. They're modified. Bleh. So they're located in the thorax. So if you go through these slides, it tells you where every one of these is. And we haven't gotten to spiders, but they use their salivary glands to spin webs. Um, again, they can produce smells. Those can be in the back or even they can have uh, stuff up close to the mouth. So it depends on the insect. There's the stinger. Just shows the modified defense gland there into the stinger. I was trying to hurry because then the last thing that I you need to make sure you know are the three different types of life cycles, right? Got three of them. What are they? Because it's in the next slide set. It's not in here. 
Do you remember? There were some terms. We had complete, incomplete. Was there a direct? You need to know the terms. Okay, I'm trying to get to life cycles down here. Okay. Oh, I'm in the wrong week. Where's, where did all the week two go in here? Oh, there it is. I closed it. Ha ha. Insect metamorphosis. That's the last thing. So make sure you go through this particular slide set to review, because there will be questions on this. Okay, so direct, incomplete, and complete. And you should know what those terms were. Do you remember the three that I put up? Know what a molt is? And in star. Did I miss it? Oh, I didn't get to the eggs. That's just the, those are the incomplete metamorphosis. So you should know what what's the most common form of metamorphosis? If it's got pupae, it's going to be a complete metamorphosis, which is what a lot of our insects do. We did go through this. It's just been a long time, hasn't it? So make sure you review that. All right, because I went through that pretty quickly because we're right at the end of class, and that's why I was hurrying, so I apologize for that.